gain some knowledge of your word and find an application to it in our lives that may benefit us or benefit others. The uh, recordings, so you ha can have the pleasure of looking at them and back in time. Again, uh, especially with regards to the way you should think of Chronicles, is that Ezra, I'm pretty sure, is, in my opinion, is the best candidate for the author. And they've come back into the land, city in ruin. And the question is, you know, are we, you know, what happened with the kings? You know, what, how do we keep these things from happening? And so that when you look at Chronicles, very much focused on the priestly, very much focused on does this king really follow the Lord or is he not following the Lord? Uh, Kings, Jeremiah is the best candidate for the book of uh, Kings as far as the <coughs> compilation. And so there they're getting ready to go into captivity. So again, a certain looking back, pulling together this information, not making it up as the critics claim, but looking uh, back in, at, at that time. And so what we get from Kings and Chronicles are important lessons of different as we're going through looking at these kings and their interaction with the prophets are valuable lessons and that if you get a kind of a feel for when these are going on and the connections with prophets you've probably done pretty good uh, so prophets spokesmen for God preachers of the covenants interpreters of the events again uh, the locus of Joel is a very good example of that. Uh, explain why the locust comes. I mean, the locust came back in 1913, but we don't have a prophet around to explain why the, they were there. I mean, it was a natural event, but we had a prophet on the scene and uh, is able to really set up and give us a history of just all of the armies that will be coming again and again. There's the test, and we have a perfect test today in today's class. Right, one of the prophets of uh, of um, Ahab saying, "Hey, go ahead, go, the Lord's going to give you victory." And so we'll see how that particular prophet does. Um, again, if you're getting lost, confused, this is probably one of the best pieces of paper or whatever that's in your notebook to look at. Um, we are tonight pretty much covering this column. And a little bit, yeah, pretty much this column for the most part. Um, and so we're dealing with Ahab. We've got some Jehoshaphat in there. We've got the impact of Jehoshaphat's bad decisions. I mean, we're talking about Asa and trying to get our heads around why Asa, who had done so many things faithful to the Lord at the very end, had that stubbornness. Wouldn't even ask the Lord to heal his deceased feet. We asked our question, Jehoshaphat, what a king. <coughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Um, James, do you remember David Maxson's sermon about the singing army? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he did. If you ever, if you really want a good story about Jehoshaphat, go listen to David Maxson's sermon about Jehoshaphat. I, it just, it, it, uh, fanta he did a fantastic job. And I just debated because I said, we're going to cut over this. We're jumping over this. And this is a, almost a sin, but we're going to do it because we have a mission. Um, now, another good way to get a feel for time and stuff is uh, kind of this table here. Lesson three, it was kind of Asa and Basha. That was the kind of lesson that we looked at. Today, we're looking at the lessons, the interactions of Ahab and the prophets and Jehoshaphat. And then uh, a, a little bit afterwards, if I'm as optimistic as I claimed when I set up the lesson. Um, Jeroboam, king north or south? James. North, okay. Now, you want to know my weird trick for remembering it? Okay, you got Rehoboam, Jeroboam, right? Okay, Rehoboam is... Uh, in the south, we, the south we call Judah, right? <laughs> Jeroboam, not Judah. <laughs> That's how I keep them. That's how, how I keep them straight. Jeroboam, not Judah. So, and he deals with the prophet Ahijah. 
And some very good lessons there. I wasn't in town for us to really cover over those, those interactions uh, with the prophet Elijah. Uh, Rehoboam, um, again, it's a lesson that, uh, uh, and again, it's part of all the Lord's plans, but asking, you know, not uh, depending on the wise men of his father, but his friends. Uh, Asa, he's the guy with all the kings, right? And these are all part of these early kings, uh, and we do that because uh, at the end of his reign, he, we come to Amri, the dad of Ahab. So, you know, uh, Nadab, the son of Jeroboam. We have Basha causing Asa trouble. And then we have all these kings kind of run through. And we start, you know, with Ahab and all the interactions there. So, and uh, again, he has the two prophets there. You know, good lessons to be made. Um, Jehoshaphat, we're going to talk about tonight. We're not going to hit how many troops he has, but for those who keep count, he had the largest reported army of the kings. So, uh, all right. Uh, again, we are still very much dealing with the Syrians uh, in that kind of time period. Uh, we got our uh, Micah. I love Micah. What a prophet. <laughs> Dealing with Ahab and Elijah, and we'll, we'll actually spend a whole time with Elisha uh, also. Uh, just to let you know, we kind of Amri, the dynasty of Amri, we have an outside mention of that. Uh, it's actually uh, dealing with Jehu, uh, and so you go to the British Museum and you see this big stone here with all these things, these people bringing uh, um, uh, tribute and stuff. Uh, to Shalmaneser the third, and um, he uh, relates Jehu as being part of the Amri dynasty. I mean, that's how um, big an impact Amri had, even though we don't really read about him. And he might have been part of, of that family, but he definitely wasn't part of Ahab's close family because Jehu destroyed them all uh, and all. So, uh, anyway... Uh, Ahab. Okay, so we had this description, and you just kind of run down this, and you know you go, "Whoa!" Now Ahab, the son of Ramri, did evil <coughs> in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him, and it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabel, king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. So, what did the Lord think of Ahab? Didn't his dad do more evil than all that were before him? And then he did more uh, evil than There may be a little scripture, but we don't have anywhere near... I mean, you know, we have maybe just that summary. Right. But, um... So I'm not going to go... What, what Jer yeah, Jeroboam was kind of the gold standard before. Oh, well, well, before, yeah. Yeah, um, and, yeah. Well, he did what is evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all that were before him. And then you go to Ahab. verse 30, and it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord and did more evil than all that were before him. So, so <laughs> it's going down. Right. Yeah. right. You see, I mean, Omri, at least as far as we know, didn't get mixed in with the Sidonians. Because that is one thing, right? Jezebel, Bell worship. You know, hey, Bell is the best. And so she brings all that in and, she, you know, hey, yeah, bring it on. And so you have that description. That stage is set. And then what does it say? What come, who comes on the scene all of a sudden? Elijah. Like, Elijah. Elijah. I mean, it's just, you know, then, you know, uh, Elijah, uh, you know, 17-1 there. We're, you know, we're 33. 
So, I mean, it just this description, and then the next thing we have is Eli. Um, he built a palace of ivory, and this is actually some of the ivory that came out of uh, Ahab's um, palace. So. And then if you have a picture of Jezebel and her death, you know, looking out the window, this was a fairly popular motif uh, of the time. But uh, that's pretty much what, the, if you envision Jezebel, by the way, you pretty well got her. Because that's from that time period, and she's looking out the window. So, but that's Jehu. That's a, another lesson away. Um, so we have Elijah. And so just he comes on the scene, just pops out, right, as far as what we're reading. But it is... The Lord, right? You have a king who's done more evil than his dad. His wife is bringing in this bell worship. And so if Ahab and Jezebel had their way, the worship of the Lord would be extinct in the northern kingdom. And so just as the Lord had raised judges up, when you think of all those judges, those former prophets, so here Elijah comes. So, I mean, you get a feel that Elijah was already around. But this is the first point that he's introduced. That you have that description. And this just, to me, is a powerful lesson. And really, one of the disadvantages is breaking the chapter there. Because you, you sort of lose a little bit. Um, so, you know, he comes and says, hey, no rain for three years. This, I mean, the times of this, agri agriculture was everything. And the way um, the... Uh, geography, everything in that land. I mean, they were dependent on the, the former rains and the latter rains. They had to have two rains to bring their crops in. And so here it is three years with none of those rains. And so after three years, um, and then there's, again, stuff that we're jumping over, uh, because our focus is those two there, is that... Um, you know, um, the Lord said, okay, Elijah, go find Ahab. And about the same time, Ahab and his servant Obadiah, they're looking to just find some grass. And they say, hey, go out and look. And so Obadiah, Elijah comes to him, and is Obadiah happy to see Elijah? <coughs> no. He was afraid because he says, okay, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to tell Ahab, you're here, and you want to talk to him. And by the time I get back, the Lord's going to call you somewhere else, and you're not going to be here, and I'm in big trouble with Ahab. And, I mean, this is an interesting thing, too, right? Is, you know, why are you going to get me killed? Because I've been hiding prophets of the Lord. You know, I've been protecting these, and now you've put this situation on me. So, again, it's kind of, you know, uh, again, it is, um, you know, Elijah really does explode onto the scene and the interactions there. Um, and so uh, Obadiah goes, you know, okay, I'm going to go tell the Lord. And so then you come down, and then here's what's kind of interesting. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, it is you, you troubler of Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have. And your father's house, getting there to Amri, right? And uh, Amri is uh, evil. Because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the bells. So, um, you know, it's sort of, you know, you look at like, the, the letter to the Corinthians, and you really kind of scratch your head why the Lord puts up with them, right? Well, you look at the interactions here, and, I mean, king after king of the, of the north, um, you know, the sins of Jer Jeroboam are mentioned. But here, Ahab is going, is that they're taking that step. They are of a mind that the worship of the Lord is not to exist. And that's a point that the Lord, the Lord is merciful. The Lord long-suffering. And he's going to send all these prophets. We're going to be looking 
uh, coming up at a whole slew of prophets, telling the people, hey, the end is coming, giving them that warning. And, but with Ahab, it was different. And if you ask yourself why it's here, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord. It's not, you're not sort of worshiping the Lord, but not doing a very good job. You have abandoned the Lord. And so the Lord rises Elijah to say, hey, to be his spokesman and to tell them, no, Ahab, the people, you cannot lead the people to abandon the Lord. So it sort of sets that stage of interaction there. So, um, uh, you know, Ahab says, hey, Give me 450 Baal uh, uh, prophets. Give me 400 prophets of Azra who eat at Jezebel Tibel and meet me at Mount Carmel. We don't know exactly where in Mount Carmel it was, but there's kind of what Mount Carmel looks like. And you kind of get the feeling that wherever it was, that you didn't have to go too far to look out into the Mediterranean. But we don't know exactly how far you'd have to go. Uh, that's the southern end. Here's the more northern end where uh, that you are closer kind of to the water. And so you have the, you know, the whole thing here, right? Uh, it says, you know, let's set up two altars, get everything set and ready, but don't light it. <coughs> depend, let us depend on our God. Bell worshiper, little G God, uh, Elijah God, big G. So, um, you know, call on your Lord on that. And so these guys, you know, they really should have known better because they knew, uh, you know, the Lord wasn't. So they just, you know, they cut themselves, they did all of this stuff, but no fire came down. And so then Elijah says, okay, it's my turn. And so he, uh, stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, he had a trench made around it to hold two, that would hold a trench big enough to hold two seas of seed. He put the wood in order, cut the bowl, laid it on the wood, and then he said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, come on, y'all, let's do it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and it filled the trench. <laughs> And so it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your work. Remember back, how's the test of a prophet? Uh, Deuteronomy. Hear, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Again, it just, you would think. And what, you know, people say, man, I could only see a miracle today, right? Because these are fickle people. This isn't the first time for somebody to see that miraculous thing come down, and then a week later, they're back to their idol worship. But again, a very powerful lesson here. And uh, also, you know, what's kind of interesting, you know, do you remember an argument uh, you know, given there, where it talks about I'm the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. I mean, you know, that that's an important kind of statement there, that this isn't the God of the dead, this is the God of the living. And so that message is given there, that reminder, and then they go and they, they kill everybody. Now, this is the reason we have our reference. Any, this is the reason I give you this stuff. So, did anyone really have a clue of what two C's of seeds were? All right, excellent. 
Um, so you can go back, and then what's interesting is it says seas of um, sea of seeds. So that's a dry material. So we look here, and if you look, C is for dry measures, and then on the page where that from, the other one was for wet stuff. So um, you know what they would apparently do is they would kind of haul out a stone, and that's what they would put kind of the dry material in. Or at least that's what these guys kind of show, and I think I've seen it somewhere else, so that uh, they kind of would know. So um, a, a little over three gallons that it, it, it filled up there. But then that's what poured off of the altar, right? And so, again, just the power of the Lord. And these people have just been consumed by all this Baal worship. Okay. And so then uh, he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And so this goes on seven times. Elijah's praying seven times. Goes out, looks over the hilltop to the Mediterranean. And in this part, that Jezreel Valley, that's where almost all the rain comes in. They had the highest amount of rain. And it comes off that ocean, and they see nothing. And then the seventh time, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. Go again, he went the seventh time. Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is raising, rising from the sea, and he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot, go down, lest the rain stops you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went back to Jezreel. So, dramatic, right? The Lord, And again, there's this drama. So, awesome class to teach the kids, right? Is it... Casey, is this like one of the favorite classes to teach the kids? Yeah. Why is this so powerful? Because the Lord was trying to get the people and to get Ahab to realize you can't abandon the Lord. Your plan is wrong. So, again, just that... You know, uh, you know. I think, you know. Again, I, I think a lot of times I'll ask, you know, the kids if I ever when I get to teach this, and we'll ask, hey, you know, what prophets have you studied? Oh, Elijah, Elisha. You know, those minor prophets, even though they're covered, isn't what the kids remember. But I will tell you that there is as many, there maybe not the powerful narrative, but there are just as powerful of verses in these minor prophets and major prophets. Uh, okay, so then our next, and again, we have these kind of things. We have the whole thing with Ahab and Naboth, right? What's my time? Where am I? 757. 757. Oh, we're not going to make it. Okay, so anyway, so we have Naboth's vineyard. It just, y'all realize that. We'll get where we get. So Naboth, you know, has this vineyard. It's right there in Jezreel. And they actually have found some vineyards now right around Israel that I don't know that they were Naboth's, but again, in that time period. And so Ahab says, hey, I really would like this. And Naboth says, well, no, this came from my inheritance. This is, you know, given to me when we came into the land. And so he goes and pouts. He goes into the palace and he's pouting. And Jezebel comes up and says, why are you pouting? They both won't give me my vineyard. And so Jezebel's saying, You're king! Why are, why, why are you letting Naboth do this? I'll take care of it. So what you have occur next is pure Sidonian methodology for getting what you want when you're the ruler. Okay? What she does, so she's going to have uh, this special event and then they have a couple of false witnesses. So they come up, and you know, this is supposed to be Naboth's big moment. Ha! No! These guys falsely accuse him, they take him out, and they stone him. And then Jezebel comes in, and says, hey, 
uh, you know, Naboth blaspheme God and the king. I mean, how much would you say Jezebel has regard for God? Not. Not. But here she uses it because Naboth, right, that she uses, hey, we got this little law here. Naboth is remembering what the Lord said, don't sell your inheritance. And so he's apparently, you know, has some belief here in God. So she uses that to have him killed. And so, you know, Naboth, so he's dead. And so he goes to enjoy his vineyard. So there he is enjoying his vineyard that his corrupt, evil wife has given him. And Ahab shows up. Uh, and so Ahab says to Elijah, You have found me, O my enemy. And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your prosperity. I will cut off from Ahab, every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. And there, will, and there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because of Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And so, you again, this, this pronouncement. And... Ahab and Jezebel aren't alone in this kind of prediction of the dogs and all of that and the birds kind of eating you. But with Jezebel, when the time comes, we have a pretty graphic description uh, there. Um, and so you, you know Jezebel doesn't care. There, there is no, there is zilch evidence that Jezebel ever had any concern for the Lord and any con, uh, belief and obedience to him. But here's the surprising thing about Ahab, that here, and again, here, you know, note when the drought, it was troubler. Here, oh my enemy. So it's kind of, the relationship has grown in a certain way. So Ahab, when he heard these, he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his flesh, fasted and lay in sackcloth, and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Had you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring down the disaster in his day, but in his son's days, I will bring the disaster in his house. So, I mean, the Lord listens to the repentant, to those who have humbled. And so, um, uh, Jonah when it comes, when we look at Jonah, the big message on Jonah, you know, why did Jonah run? Why did all of that? Because Jonah says, Lord, I knew you were merciful. <laughs> he had seen the history. He knew what the Lord did when people humbled themselves. And he says, these people, they're going to listen. They're going to humble themselves. They're going to repent, and you're not going to destroy the city. And Assyria, they're going to come and get us one day. They might not today, but they're coming to destroy us. And this is the chance to wipe them out. But Lord, you're going to be merciful. I had no desire. I mean, the worst preacher ever, right? As far as his mindset in preaching the word. Um, but pretty powerful. So, um, it just, again, the mercy of the Lord. And again, the patience of the Lord with Israel. And then he's going to have that same patience with Judah. We're going to see that. Same patience. But what you see in both the cases here and in the cases of Judah, he's going to try to warn the people. He's going to say, repent. So, you know, I have a case against you. And he's going to lay out the case. And it all goes back to Deuteronomy 28. 
I mean, they knew. They knew what was going to happen. The Lord told them. And even, you know, you look at Joshua when he talked to the people. All right, so, Jehoshaphat. Let's get rid of... <laughs> let's, let's take a breather for about two seconds. Uh, Jehoshaphat. Uh, good or bad king? Good king. Uh, he walked all the way, uh, in all the way of Asa's father. He did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. Um, but a lot of it, you know, apparently it's lessons he learned from Asa. So, you know, we kind of were asking questions about Asa, but here it's described as Asa was good, so was, was Jehoshaphat. He learned from those examples of his father. Um, 35, when he began to reign, he reigned for 25 years, uh, apparently died of old age, and if you do the math, you should end up with around 60 uh, that he died. Uh, he made peace, marriage alliances. Um, his uh, mom was Azaba, daughter of Shilahi. Shilahi? Anyway. Um, he had war with the Moabites, Ammonites, Edom, Syria, and you count up his armies and you're over a million. So the largest army. Uh, buried in the city of David with his fathers. Uh, taught, and here's, I mean, this is where the Chronicles comes in, right? We looked at Kings, we don't get this. We get a little bit. But boy, in Chronicles, we just are blown away by Jehoshaphat. Taught the law. Levi priests as judges. He exterminated the remnant. He put the high place, uh, uh, but the high places were not taken away. So again, hard time with those high places. Um, so again, a good king, but there's the one problem, and that's kind of where we're moving to, is he had a desire for unity, right? He it just he so much wanted to see the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom brought back. So he says, I, you know, I'm willing. My son is going to marry uh, a daughter of Abraham, of Ahab. I'm going to bring in that king, given that description, and that is who my son's going to marry. And we're going to see all this grief come into the south. But it just, you see it again and again, Jehoshaphat's desire to bring the two kingdoms back, to have them as one. Um... Because uh, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. So he chronicles, goes even another step, right? It's not Asa. He walks in the ways of David. Um, he did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, walked in his commandments, not according to the practices of Israel. So, I mean, and this is setting this up, right? Because we then get this whole interaction with Ahab and him. Uh, his heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord, and furthermore, he took the high places and the ashram out of Judah. <coughs> so, most likely what happened here is that, yeah, when he became king, he took them out, but the people you know, brought it back. So, if you look at the end of his reign, they're still there, even though at one point he took them away, but they're weeds. Okay, the high places, the ashram are weeds. And so, uh, his third year of reign, he sent the officials to teach in the cities of Judah. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went about through all the cities of Judah and taught amongst the people. And we just don't hear that so much about all the kings, do we? But he made it a point. He wanted the people to know the law, to teach them. And again, you know, it's that teaching, you know, you read, you know, the walls of Jer Jericho, right? Who would have used that as a military plan that they had? No. Who would have used it as a military plan singing as you're going to go face this overwhelming army? Who would have had that as your military plan? Nobody. Unless the people and the king have faith. And that's, you know, you, we read, Asa, Asa, if you had come to me, Rather than going to the Syrians, we would have taught those Syrians a lesson. You know, we would have had that description. We see what Jehoshaphat did. Just think what Asa uh, could have done. But he was at that age, that point, he wasn't willing to put in that faith. So, um, 
For three years, Syria and Israel continued in war. And in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. So how do you come down if you're heading north? Uh, it's elevation. Elevation, right. Good answer, Larry. I knew you could do it. I, I listened the last time. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead it belongs to us? And we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hands of the king of Syria. So Jehoshaphat, this nice big army, Ahab, you know, they come up there. We're buddy buddies. We're sitting there at the entrance of the gate, sitting there by, by each other at the gate. You know, let's go beat up on Ramoth Gilead. And so Jehoshaphat <laughs> says, okay, uh, um, inquire first of the word, uh, for the word of the Lord. Let's inquire from the Lord. So 400 men come up. Shall we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for God will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, um, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of, of whom we can require? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire <coughs> of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Emli, but I hate him. For he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. Okay? Ahab happens to be the what a king of Israel? The most evil. <laughs> So there's one man who tells the truth. And the king of Israel summoned an offer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Emli. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were setting their thrones, arrayed in their robes, and they were sitting at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying there before him. And then you got Zedekiah, the son of Janiah. He had made iron horns. And then this guy shows up big. And he's running around. This isn't the only prophet who does this. And says, thus the Lord will push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, go up. You're going to be successful. You're going to triumph. And the messenger uh, went to, to, uh, that was summoned said, behold, okay, Micaiah, all the prophets, 400, victory for the Lord. Or for, uh, for, for Ahab. And Micaiah says, as the Lord lives, that's my God said, what my God says, that's what I'm going to speak. And when he had, had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And he answered, go up and triumph. There will be given unto your hand. Now this is when you kind of wish, you kind of know what the tone was, right? Yeah. I kind of tried to say it. I was it. But it is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Whatever it was, <laughs> Ahab knew it wasn't the truth. However he said those words. But the king said, How many times have I, shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep with no shepherd. And the Lord says, these have no masters. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, If you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Hear all you people. <coughs> so he's given the test. Yeah. <coughs> this, he's given the test of the prophets. And this is short term. So there's none of this 700 years wait. It is he will they will know pretty quick whether Micaiah is teaching the truth, is giving the truth. Now Ahab, this point was said. What was Ahab's plan to get around God's prophecy? Oh, he was going to the skies. He was going to the sky. Jehoshaphat, you dress up as a king. I'm going to disguise yeah, myself. Why did you show up? For a man I really like. But I like Gedaliah. You know, I have problems. The kings and your rulers I really like end up, they don't seem too smart sometimes. <laughs> um, but um, so there, you know, they say, hey, you know. And then, you know, uh, the Syrian king says, hey, we're going to go after the king. So they go after Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat says, hello, no, I'm, 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 I'm not. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not at it. So, uh, and here's right off it. It's way over here, but it's on the roads. If you control this road, this road, this road, you have the wealth of Solomon. So, uh, do the roads have a name? They do. Uh, Plains, Kings Road, and then I think it's Mountain or something. Uh, I don't remember all three of them, Chester. My apologies for not remembering the names. But yes, they do have names. Uh, but those three roads, if you control them, you control all the trade. So there's kind of a chariot of the time. So there, you know, there's Ahab, there's Jehoshaphat, they're on that. And so he disguises. And so um, a certain man drew his bow at random, struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate, and he dies. So Ahab's plans are foiled. And I guess that's not too bad a time. All right. So, anyway. Um, so, Jehoshaphat makes big mistakes, right? His big mistakes, four. Uh, made peace with Israel, joined in war with Ahab, married his son off to Athila, and partnered with the heads of the king of of Israel. So I will try, what we'll do now is roll the rest of this class in with the next class, and so we'll have an even more challenging time. <laughs> All right, very good.